Today I'd like to discuss the relationship between knowledge and understanding of the world religions and global citizenship. Baha'u'llah states the following. Let your vision be world embracing rather than confined to your own selves. I believe as a Baha'i that it is vital in this day for human beings to reach out to each other and try to understand each other's belief systems and traditions. We live in a world where there are borders and boundaries that are ideological in nature. And the world is tired and hurting because of the tensions and conflicts that arise at these borders. We must open up dialogue. And I want to offer a series of ideas about how and why that this is essential. And I'm going to use the analogy of three fountains. The fountain of knowledge, the fountain of understanding, and then the fountain of beauty. Intellect is, in truth, the most precious gift bestowed upon man by the divine bounty. Be ye in that land vanguards of the perfections of humankind. Carry forward the various branches of knowledge, be active and progressive in the field of invention and the arts. Intellect and understanding is actually part of what it means to be human. We're asked here to recognize that our intellects is one of the most precious gifts bestowed by God unto humankind, and that we should be striving to be vanguards in this world, within the areas of sciences and the inventions and the arts. I believe that comparative religious knowledge and an understanding of the many traditions of our world is vital in the path whether or not one is a Baha'i. There is no doubt that this path is difficult, as with the subsequent stages that we're going to go through in this deepening. But everything that is worth it, that is noble, that is valuable, in the end comes with a price. In some sense, this is how we recognize its true worth. When we are in earnest in our search for anything, we look for it everywhere. This principle we must carry out in our search for truth. It means also that we must be willing to clear away all that we have previously learned. All that would clog our steps on the way to truth. We must not shrink, if necessary, from beginning our education all over again. If a man engageth with all his power in the acquisition of a science or in the perfection of an art, it is as if he has been worshipping God in churches and temples. If we are truly seeking knowledge, we will seek it everywhere. And if we're truly trying to understand the human condition and the world in which we live, it is absolutely essential that we try to understand the religious traditions and the religious texts that have undergirded social movements for all of human history. What's beautiful in the Baha'i writings is that just as arts are worship, so too is the path of knowledge. So too is this search for understanding. I remember there was a friend of mine that I was talking to one day, and this individual was very, very diligent about actually reading all the Western classics, the classics of literature. And I have to be honest, I myself have not all read all of what we would generally call the Western classics. Uh, I focus most of my attention upon philosophical and religious texts. I do, however, acknowledge their beauty, adore literature, even though I don't spend a great deal of time in it. And I said this to my friend. And this person looked puzzled and they said, well, I don't understand. How could you, like, you tried to be an educated person. Um, how could you not have read? And she listed a whole series of books that I have not read. <laughs> and I said, I, I do really, really recognize the absolute beauty and value of some of the great literary pieces of the Western tradition. At the same time, um, have you ever read the Dhammapada? And the answer was no. Have you ever read the Bhagavad Gita? Have you ever read the Upanishads? Um, we went through this, for example, having read the entire New Testament, or having read the Quran. And in each case, the answer was no. And I said, well, these are the classics that in many cases inform the classics you're, you're 
listing. And if they're true or not, they are the undergirding, the foundation of the cultures in which you're moving. See, this is actually the path myself where I began studying comparative religion because I wanted to understand the world in which I lived. I wanted to understand history. I wanted to understand the social history of humankind. What I suddenly realized is that if I didn't get at least somewhat of a grasp of the various world religions and what they believed, I wouldn't really be able to see properly these periods of history which were so influenced by these ideas. I realized basically that to understand history, to understand what undergirds much of the philosophy, the geopolitics and society in general, were the traditions that these communities found sacred. I realized as well that there was much I had to relearn because as I began to read, um, if you will, introductions and histories of these different traditions, I realized that there were many things I had been told that were not true. Likewise, when I began to read the sacred texts of these traditions, for example, the Dhammapada, or the Bhagavad Gita of Hinduism, or the Quran or the Bible, I realized that I had been told things that were just patently false, and that I was going to have to relearn again. Yet this can be actually a beautiful and exciting path. I think here, um, the analogy or the example, sorry, the anecdote I usually use is when I first began my path to studying world religions, I had decided, as I said, to try to understand the world history and social movements. And I had actually moved to a different city and I encountered two individuals that I was working with. I was actually working on a loading dock in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. And these two individuals, one was a Muslim and one was a Hindu. These were two traditions that in my early 20s I knew almost nothing about, but I had decided I wanted to understand them. So I started reaching out to these individuals and asking them questions about Hinduism and about Islam. And I was given an introduction to Islam by, by my coworker. Um, it was at this time that I realized something else. I realized not only did I have a lack of understanding of my world because I had a lack of understanding a lack of knowledge of these different traditions, but that I had sort of cut myself off from the ability to communicate with these people because in discussing with them, I saw just how beautiful they found their traditions and that I wouldn't be able to relate to them if I didn't reach out in that area. However, here within the, if you will, the path of knowledge or the fountain of knowledge, um, this really is where one learns just the basic facts about a world religion. They start to understand where the founders came from, what area, era of history they were in, what are some of the main scriptures, what are the same, some of the main tenets or the social structures of that religion. And it's really important because then it actually starts to take shape. The tradition begins to become, if you will, an entity in itself. And we can somehow begin to relate to it. And I think to be an educated person and a world citizen, if you will, it is vital that we can act, that we learn these facts, that we have a general knowledge of different traditions. And this again does not simply go uh, for the world's religious traditions, but actually the philosophical traditions themselves. To understand at least what Marxism is, or to understand what existentialism is, or Neoplatonism is. What is atheism? What is agnosticism? These are really, really important. And it's at this point I think we get to what I would call the path of understanding. Before jumping in, I just want to read a quote from Baha'u'llah. Blessed and happy is he that ariseth to promote the best interests of the peoples and kindreds of the earth. It is not for him to pride himself who loveth his own country, but rather for him who loveth the whole world. The earth is but one country, and mankind its citizens. I believe that this path first of knowledge and then of understanding, which I will try to better define, is what promotes the best interests of the peoples and kindreds of the earth. I believe that it is something that actually enables us to grow as people and to be able to relate more and more to the peoples of our world. 
In this case, I think of a world traveler. I myself have traveled to several different countries. I taught English overseas for several years. And it's very easy to see a fact, say, the way people eat, or what they eat, or how they interact around a, a dinner table, or how they interact politically, and not understand it, in fact, rapidly misunderstand it, even though, in a sense, you can see what they're doing, or you see their traditions. Understanding is a very different level. And when it comes to the world religions, I think very often, especially because if we're dealing with an interfaith environment, we might want to sort of know some simple facts about the tradition, you know, who was the founder, what's a little bit of its history, what are its sacred texts, and maybe know a couple quotes from that tradition. But we don't really want to go past, if you will, that surface layer of even multiculturalism, where we just know their, you know, their basic language, their foods, their traditions, to going to a deeper level where we try to start understanding how this tradition sees the world. And I want to really make a difference here. Understanding is not agreeing. It might actually feel threatening because we might feel that we might get to the point where we like, agree and appreciate someone else's tradition. But it's not the same thing. I think it's very beautiful to try to understand how a Buddhist can see their world, or a Hindu, or a Christian, or a Muslim, or a Jew. And I believe if we're trying to heal our planet, this is what we need to do. Even if in the end we wish to have that person, say, become a Christian, or become a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or a Baha'i, or an atheist. If we're not actually understanding how they see their world, if we believe that that was actually a jungle they were lost in, we're not going to be able to guide them out. So whether or not you agree, the other part of understanding is really important because it gives you an understanding of what that person is seeking and what is being fulfilled within the tradition that they live within. I know when I first began on this path, I actually found it somewhat threatening, <laughs> to be frank. I, I realized that there was a moment where I sort of had a pullback from what I suddenly saw as a new goal, to move beyond this level of just facts and knowledge to a, a deeper level where I begin to understand how these people see the world. It was almost as if, uh, yeah, that, that was a little bit scary. When I felt that reaction, I suddenly realized I had to move forward. Because I could not be afraid of an idea, afraid of a book, afraid of some scripture. It actually then suddenly called me in deeper and I wanted to try to understand. So how is it that this individual sees the world from inside the Islamic tradition? Or a Islamic tradition? For there are many. How does an individual from the Buddhist world see reality? And how do they see each other? How do they see themselves and the role they have within this life? Because then I would be able, one, to more deeply understand, but also connect with these individuals. Because I could reach out and see, well, I can actually see how you see the world and why you're doing what you're doing. What suddenly dawned on me in this journey from, if you will, the factoid level, and to try to understand how someone sees their tradition and sees the world and themselves within it from that tradition. I suddenly ran up against another issue. It was this. <laughs> if I want to try to understand, say, the Hindu tradition, and in that sense understand my fellow brothers and sisters in this planet who are Hindus, it dawned on me that I was going to have to be able to try to see the beauty they see in that tradition. I would have to move even beyond understanding to understand what is it, for example, about the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads that makes someone's heart move towards it that makes someone love it and see it as beautiful. Now again, I'm going to stress this multiple times. This doesn't mean I would agree with them that I would have to become a Hindu. 
it's that there are, are millions and in some case billions of people or hundreds of millions of people who look at these traditions and are deeply attracted to them. So what is it that they see that they find beautiful? You might be an atheist, for example, and you're looking at Christianity and you know some of some of the basic facts and now you're starting to try to understand how a Christian sees their world. Yet if you cannot see how aspects within Christianity can be genuinely beautiful, to be frank, there's actually a wall in front of you and you cannot understand something about the human condition. Because something in the human condition has been seeing beauty in this tradition for 2,000 years. But this goes so for Judaism or Zoroastrianism. Um, and the example I usually give uh, is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The sea beauty in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, the Epic of Gilgamesh is an ancient Sumerian text. It was translated into multiple other languages throughout the history of the Near East. So this was from Sumer in Iraq, <laughs> thousands and thousands of years before Christ. And the Epic of Gilgamesh has as its main character, Gilgamesh, who was a semi-divine king. Anyway, <laughs> what ends up happening is, is Gilgamesh encounters this other character named Enkidu. And Enkidu and he, at first, are, are actually loggerheads and they battle. But then they become dear, dear, dear friends. And there's one part within the Epic of Gilgamesh where Enkidu, his dear brother, the dear brother of Gilgamesh, gets killed. And Gilgamesh holds Enkidu in his arms and it says, and he held him till the worm took him. Meaning that Gilgamesh held in his arms his dearest friend until he began to rot. I use this as an example for a couple of reasons. One, no one currently believes in the religion of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Secondly, it sounds gross on the surface. And yet, we have to, if we want to try to understand human psychology, understand why this is beautiful. And I do actually think it is beautiful. I think it's actually an exquisite image where an individual loves someone so much that the repulsive nature of their body as it begins to decay does not matter to them because they just love them. There's so much about the spirit that filled this human or this physical temple of Enkidu that he does not care that it's rotting in his arms. It's just an expression of his undying love from Gilgamesh to Enkidu. And I think this is actually important because no one currently is going to be believing in the Epic of Gilgamesh as a true religious text. Um, and it highlights this facet that I do not believe seeing beauty necessitates that we actually believe in a tradition. It's just that it simply gets more and more threatening because we're getting closer and closer to what that feels like for someone who is a believer in Enkidu and Gilgamesh. Or, for the example, as we first know about the Bhagavad Gita, or say we've read it, which pretty much would take about two to two weeks, even if you're going slow, <laughs> then we get the basic understanding of what it is, and then we move into this stage where we're trying to deeply understand it. So we start looking at the tradition and how it actually shapes one's vision. And then we move to this other step where we're trying to actually genuinely see the beauty of the Bhagavad Gita and why an individual would have a feeling of devo devotion in love in their appreciation of the beauty of the divine Krishna. But this still does not necessarily mean that we have to become a Hindu. Any more than seeing beauty in the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu necessitates that we actually believe in the pantheon of Sumer. Thinking at all times of rendering some service to every member of the human race. Pay ye no heed to aversion and rejection, to disdain, hostility, and justice. Act ye in the opposite way. Be ye sincerely kind, 
not in appearance only. Let him do some good to every person whose path he crosseth, and be of some benefit to him. Let him prove the character of each and all, and reorient the minds of men. Every time we encounter another person, we have the ability to render service simply by asking questions and seeking to understand what the belief system is of the person in front of us, then seeking beyond that knowledge and understanding of how they see the world, and then trying to look for its beauty. Even if, on the surface, we have an aversion to it. Every person we cross the path, we can reorient the minds of men by trying to encourage them to have, in one example, a path of knowledge, a journey along the path of knowledge, and to seek to move beyond just the fact level to a place of understanding, and then actually opening up to some of the beauties of that other person's belief, which again does not necessitate that we have to agree. I think in this it's really important because there are so many things within our culture that actually truly end up becoming taboo topics. I know within my own culture we often present ourselves as being open to any kind of dialogue, as if we've shed our taboos, as if we put aside notions of blasphemy. And yet at the same time there are many topics, at least in my own experience of Western culture, that end up really being taboo. And they usually are the kinds of topics that we're talking about here today. Topics about the path to try and find the good, the true, and the beautiful. That it is far more easy within, say, one's workplace, or in normal social settings, to be cynical, crass, vulgar, to actually fixate, if you will, in conversation on one's own personal and selfish desires, than it is to do the opposite, to speak about nobility and sacrifice, about sacrificing for the good, sacrificing for the true, and trying to seek real beauty in one's life. So it's important that we, when we encounter each other, try and open up that kind of conversation, to go past, if you will, the new taboos that we have within our culture, and really, really try and open up dialogue around understanding each other, seeking to know and understand each other, and trying even to see the beauty within those whom we would normally disagree. It is vital for our world because we have to reach out. And if we can actually see beauty in someone else's tradition, even if we disagree with them, in the end we can at least show them a way out of a dark forest and bring them into a more beautiful field. I just wanted to take a minute to thank everyone who has visited us at Bridging Beliefs, either on the videos or in the podcasts, sacrificed their time to try to listen to some of these ideas and reflect upon them. I apologize that I do not respond within the comment section. Every once in a while, if it's a simple practical matter, my friend who does the editing, uh, Shahru Shodbach, will actually throw out a little piece of information. Unfortunately, as a father, and a full-time worker, <laughs> and someone who homeschools his own children and tries to do research and development, I don't often have the time. As well, I apologize, but within the, with the internet community, often, if you will, e-dialogue can be very difficult. We don't get to see each other's face, hear the tones of voice that we're using, and really connect with the spirit of the person. I would rather take the time to try and offer what I understand and know, and let people take it or leave it as they will. Again, thank you for taking the time um, to listen to us, and God bless. <laughs>